Airlines make money by transporting passengers and cargo from A to B. There are times when that is much easier said than done. Weather is of huge note to airlines and pilots when planning their flights. From nearly day one in ground school, pilots are taught the ins and outs of meteorological conditions. Pilots have no choice but to work with the sky, not against it. Aviation history is littered with accidents where weather played a crucial role in the event. Weather, coupled alongside with pilot and human error, is one of the primary causes of plane crashes. In this video, we are going to analyze the events of two incidents involving passenger planes in what can best be described as appalling flying weather. In these accidents, the pilots made approaches to their respective airports in abysmal weather, which were beyond the safe limits for landing their plane. The events occurred just a few months apart, and serve as a reminder as to not take chances with people's lives. However, before we look at these incidents further, I feel it may be necessary to define a word I will be using frequently in discussing both of these accidents. We need to define what the term crosswind means. In the aviation world, a crosswind can have multiple definitions. In one instance, it refers to a section of an approach pattern where an aircraft is flying perpendicular to a runway. However, for this video, it's the meteorological meaning that is of interest. When an airport is built, it is possible to take advantage of the area's prevailing wind. A prevailing wind is the direction that the wind is predominantly blowing in that area. For example, in the United Kingdom, it is common for winds to blow from the southwest. As such, many airports across the country take full advantage of this to allow aircraft to more commonly make an approach with a headwind, which makes for a more easier and more comfortable approach. Even though runways can be set up to strategically take advantage of the local meteorological conditions, the weather can still be unpredictable and winds unreliable. A crosswind is where a wind is blowing at a considerable angle or even perpendicular to a runway. This can blow a plane off course on its approach and as such pilots must make corrections to their heading to fly more with the wind, which is why you can sometimes see videos of planes landing askew. This is not uncommon nor is it unsafe. Pilots are taught early on in flight training of how to deal with a crosswind. Aircraft manufacturers set out boundaries as to how extreme of a crosswind their plane can fly through for a windy landing. It is however unsafe to exceed these boundaries that not only include winds but also visibility, icing and other severe weather conditions. Planes are designed to withstand the elements, coming with all kinds of tools to help a pilot through tough weather. Everything from anti-ice technology to weather radars, these tools help keep passengers and crews safe when in the air. June 1, 1999. American Airlines Flight 1420 is preparing to depart Dallas-Fort Worth Airport on a short one-hour flight to Little Rock, Arkansas. There are 145 passengers and crew on board. The plane on this flight this evening is a McDonnell Douglas MD-82 plane. In the 1990s, this plane is highly popular, especially in the United States. American Airlines operated hundreds of them at the time. The MD-80 series was developed from the DC-9. This newer plane from McDonnell Douglas features all the modern displays that pilots have become familiar with, including a weather radar. It will be needed as weather is barely within the safe limits for flying. There have been severe thunderstorms in the area all evening and it hasn't been letting up. The National Weather Service has been issuing notices for thunderstorms and is monitoring the situation in the American South. There are severe thunderstorms all along the entire route to Little Rock. Piloting Flight 1420 this evening is Captain Richard Bushman, aged 48. A family man, former Air Force pilot, and captain with over 10,000 flight hours. He had also previously flown the Boeing 727 before switching to the MD-80. His first officer is Michael Origel, aged 35. He has only been with American Airlines for less than a year. He trained to be a pilot with the US Navy, making this flight crew one of military background. American Airlines policies state that duty time cannot exceed 14 hours, and Flight 1420 is the crew's last flight of the day, however they have been informed of a delay in their evening schedule. Their planned departure time was 8.28pm, however this time has come and gone, and passengers are awaiting anxiously for news on their flight this evening. 
the flight crew had notified American Airlines dispatch operations of their limited duty time. To work around this, the airline had substituted the plane for flight 1420. This allowed for a revised departure time of 11.40pm. Monitoring the weather situation, the forecast at Little Rock was not looking good. They needed to get flying soon to beat the oncoming storm. The flight to Little Rock is only of one hour. In the case of the inability to land there, their alternate airport is located over 300 miles away at Nashville, Tennessee. Leaving Dallas at 20 to midnight, American Airlines Flight 1420 heads northeast for Little Rock, Arkansas. Despite the bad weather, most of the flight was relatively routine. The destination airport, Little Rock National Airport, is of an abnormally large size for not only the city in which it's located, but also the level of traffic in which it serves. It features three runways, very spacious taxiways, but only a single passenger terminal. At the moment, Flight 1420 has been scheduled to land on runway 22 left. However, the weather has shown to be unpredictable, and the tower advises the flight crew of wind shear. Wind shear to pilots is a phenomenon where there is an extreme change in wind direction over a short distance. It can be dangerous as a rapid change from a headwind to a tailwind can result in a decrease in lift. Pilots must be able to identify, correct and recover their plane in this scenario. Captain Bushman requests a change in approach even now that they were lining up for runway 22 left. They must now fly back around to the other side of the airport and land on runway 04 right. Because of their proximity to the airport already, the tower clears flight 1420 for a visual approach onto runway 04 right. However, they lose sight of the runway in the clouds. Added to this delay, the tower then tries getting flight 1420 to try an ILS approach to the runway. ILS stands for Instrument Landing System. It's a reliable piece of technology in aviation where a localizer beacon sends out vertical and horizontal information to an airplane which is then displayed on a pilot's primary flight display. Keeping the markers on the flight display centered will guide the plane to the foot of the runway along a glide slope descent path, of which a lot of the times is flown by the autopilot. The flight crew of Flight 1420 have inadvertently increased their workload drastically. They are rushing to get the plane landed and in doing so don't properly complete the pre-landing checks, which noted in the MD-80 flight manual includes checks for flaps and checks for spoilers. We must now talk about just how a plane gets configured for landing. Planes slow down on approach. In order to help with keeping a low speed and keep stable when flying an approach, flaps are used. Flaps, in simple terms, are wing extensions. They draw outward from the trailing edge of a wing which increases its size. The bigger wing provides more lift when flying at a slower speed. Spoilers, on the other hand, stand up on the wing once the plane is on the ground. They can be armed before landing so that once the plane touches down, these spoilers automatically activate. They drastically reduce an aircraft's lift, which helps keep the plane firmly on the ground. Once a plane is on the ground, reverse thrust is often applied to redirect the airflow from the engines to slow a plane once it's on the runway. Then there are automatic and manual braking systems which help with the slowdown further. The flight crew of Flight 1420 did not set up the spoilers to automatically deploy and also did not set any flap configuration during the time they were supposed to run through the checklist. On top of that, they also did not set any automatic braking. Runway 04 right at Little Rock is just over 2 kilometers in length. It is of adequate length for the MD-80 even in wet conditions. However, what is not adequate are the wind's invisibility. The tower radioed a weather report to the crew of Flight 1420, citing that the winds are 330 at 25 knots. The crew are attempting to land their plane and reduce visibility in a thunderstorm at an airport that is reporting wind shear with a crosswind of 25 knots. The recommended crosswind limit for an MD-80 in these conditions is just 20 knots. However, Captain Bushman does not take the opportunity to abandon the approach. Instead, the crew continue with the landing. At just 1,000 feet, First Officer Origel noticed that no flaps were configured and dialed in a flap position of 40 degrees, the maximum on this plane. A lot goes on once the plane touches down, so let's break this down further. The MD-80 touches down on the runway and immediately begins sliding. To quote First Officer Origel himself as he says, we're sliding. The crew failed to previously set automatic braking and spoilers, and they have also failed to manually deploy the spoilers themselves. The plane continues to slide down the runway with inadequate braking power. The reverse thrust is activated, however its effects have been minimized without other landing measures in place. 
The plane then overruns the runway, destroying airport fencing and localizer equipment beyond the end of the runway, where it then hits the structure supporting the runway landing lights, where it comes to a rest after the fuselage breaks into two. Eleven people on board the plane were killed, including Captain Bushman. Dozens of other passengers were taken to hospital with serious injuries, including First Officer Origel. Following the accident, the investigation led by the National Transportation Safety Board concluded that the cause of the crash was caused by the crew's decision to not abort the landing and the failure to properly configure the plane for an approach. The investigation and reports cite fatigue and stress from the airline as a contributing factor to the crash. The pilots were undeniably tired. Captain Bushman had been awake for over 16 hours at the time of the incident. American Airlines Flight 1420 highlighted the fact that many airlines try to keep to a strict schedule with their planes and crew. The pressure on the crew to get on the ground and get the job done could have hindered their judgement of the weather conditions around them to make diverting or abandoning their approach for a go-around seem unfavourable. In the end, American Airlines had amended their checklists and procedures so that both pilots have to agree that their plane is properly configured for landing. It's a bit shaky there. It's oh, a bit wow. shaky? Yeah. It's like... Uh, this guy's having a hard oh time. My oh, oh my god! Oh my god! It's crashed! Oh my god. Oh, oh my god! Oh my god! Just under three months following the American Airlines incident, another passenger plane crashed in severe weather conditions. Mandarin Airlines Flight 642 was a flight between Bangkok and Taipei, with a stopover in Hong Kong. This incident took place on the approach on the first leg between Bangkok and Hong Kong. The plane is a McDonnell Douglas MD-11, a wide-body three-engine passenger plane, the last of its kind. The MD-11 has had an excellent safety record in its time, with only two recorded hull losses of the passenger variant, Mandarin Airlines Flight 642 being the second of the only two, the other being Swiss Air Flight 111, which crashed the previous year. Mandarin Airlines is a subsidiary of the Taiwanese national air carrier China Airlines. 57-year-old Gerardo Lettich is a highly experienced Italian-born captain with over 17,000 flight hours at the time. His first officer was 36-year-old Liu Chengxi, who has logged over 4,000 flight hours. He was the one at the flight controls on Flight 642. On the evening of the 22nd of August 1999, their stopover as Flight 642 was Hong Kong's new Cheplop Gok Airport. The airport had only opened the previous year, replacing the old Kai Tak Airport that had become so overcrowded. There are 315 passengers and crew on board the flight this evening. A tropical storm has been making its way through the region. The weather at Hong Kong is abysmal. Winds are 35 knots from the northwest. It's a strong crosswind that is above the limit for the MD-11 plane. It's raining with visibility of just six kilometers. Thunderstorms are also forecasted. The crew had been deliberating on whether or not to divert the plane straight to their final destination of Taipei if the weather situation in Hong Kong was to not improve and be unsafe for landing. Enough fuel was loaded in Bangkok for the full journey. It's a fully loaded plane. The total weight of the plane is over 99% of the maximum landing weight by the time of landing. Based on the latest reports from the airport which was received by the flight crew during their journey to Hong Kong, they decided to make an approach anyway. Traffic ahead of Flight 642 seemed to indicate a bumpy approach, as there had been several missed approaches reported by other aircraft. Five planes ahead of them had even diverted to other airports. Despite this, the crew of Flight 642 continued their approach to Hong Kong. The controllers on the ground had given the crew of Flight 642 an ILS approach to runway 25 left. At 10.36 in the evening, they are given a heading to intercept the signal coming from the airport. All is well on the approach up until this point. At 700 feet, the autopilot was disconnected as the flight crew made visual contact with the runway. After disconnecting the autopilot, the plane begins to drift below the glide slope. At 250 feet, first officer Liu Chengxi noticed a decrease in airspeed and so applied more power to the engines, raising his speed up to 175 knots. On the MD-11, once the onboard radio altimeter hits 50 feet above the ground below, 
it automatically sets the autothrottle to the idle position ready for landing. Then in a short span of time, the descent rate drops to a rate of up to 800 feet per minute, way above what a plane should be doing in this very late phase of the approach. The first officer makes an attempt to raise the nose of the plane to flare the aircraft for landing, however the instability of this approach causes the right side undercarriage landing gear to hit the runway with a heavy impact. The damage to the landing gear also damages the right wing structure. The number 3 engine on the right wing also comes in contact with the runway. The right side wing structure then fails and is ripped from the fuselage. The resulting outpouring of jet fuel causes the plane to burst into flames. The absence of one of the plane's wings causes the MD-11 to flip onto its back. Skidding off the runway, the plane comes to a rest in flames. Fire and rescue services arrive on the crash site moments later. Three people are killed in the crash. Miraculously, 312 people on board this plane survived. 45 people were taken to hospital with serious injuries, but all of them recovered. A further 164 people are treated for minor injuries. The flight crew survived and escaped through the main passenger exit at the front of the plane after helping passengers escape from the wreckage. The investigation found that the causes of the crash included the weather and winds at the airport, but also the pilot's inability to stabilize the aircraft and failure to counteract the high rate of descent appropriately. As such, safety recommendations were given to China Airlines, to which they disputed, saying that the plane threw into a weather phenomenon known as a microburst, where winds can change excessively and can be hidden to pilots. Some have also made a possible link between the crash of Flight 642 and a string of incidents involving the MD-11 directing interest to the plane's unusually shaped tail fin. Modifications made to the plane as was developed from the DC-10 led McDonnell Douglas to make amendments to this tail fin. Several incidents, including one which occurred just two years prior to the crash of Flight 642 at Newark Airport in the United States, where a FedEx MD-11 cargo plane crashed in a very similar way to that of Flight 642. From a hard landing, the plane burst into flames and flipped onto its back. Another FedEx MD-11 also crashed in similar circumstances again in 2009 at Tokyo's Narita Airport. In 2010, yet again, another MD-11 crashed because of a hard landing, this time a Lufthansa cargo MD-11 in Saudi Arabia. All of these MD-11 incidents were all the result of a hard landing in some form, and as such, some have linked these all together under a design flaw in the MD-11. As for these two incidents, weather was merely a factor to the crash. Pilot error played the largest role in these accidents. In both accidents, flight crews failed to stabilize or configure their plane on top of making an approach with crosswinds that exceeded their plane's limits. Hello everyone, a very big thanks to all of you who have watched this video and have been watching all of the other videos. The support I've gotten these past few weeks has been incredible and I'm truly thankful for this opportunity to make content for you. I'd like to once again quickly thank my patrons for their continued support. If you want to get your name featured on screen here at the end of the next video, you can join my Patreon which will be linked in the pinned comment. There is a Patreon exclusive disaster breakdown video which is in the works. I've been working on that between the regular videos so that will be finished in due time. Anyway, a thank you to my £5 patron KTP123 and again a very special thanks to my £10 patron Cherub Cherub. Thanks once again for the support, you are a legend, thank you. And that's it for me today, thanks and have a good day.